Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Now, I'll tell you the backstory behind um, why I decided to, uh, to write this book. It's, um, it's, uh, I've written a number of books on China, <laughs> uh, but this book came about because I was at an academic conference. I was, in, I was at um, Hangzhou University, and it was an international conference with a number of uh, academics from all around the world who have looked at uh, very detailed aspects of, of Chinese development, estimating regressions, um, hopefully not making too many errors in Excel spreadsheets, and um, and and producing you know very sort of uh, very balanced, very um, detailed analyses. And the chairperson um, just looked up and said, um, "Okay, well we've heard these papers. So can any of you actually tell me if you break down Chinese growth, what actually drives it?" pretty simple question <laughs> to which most of the people in the conference, not just at this conference, but many others, um, haven't really uh, been able to answer. And actually, the, the reason for it is, is it's, it's pretty understandable in the sense because Chinese statistics are not as well wrought as those in the West. It's difficult to make those breakdowns using um, aggregate statistics to say what has driven growth is a capital, is a labor. But one thing about Chinese data um, is that the micro-level statistics, household surveys, what firms produce, these are actually uh, fairly well documented. And so what I've done is to try and take the micro data, actually what people earn, what firms produce, and then you marry that, you integrate that into the larger macro trends. And in that way, um, try and um, assess what these studies, which have been numerous in terms of Chinese growth, um, tells us about what drives growth in the world's second biggest economy. I'm sure many of you will have seen these forecasts of China becoming the world's biggest economy. It used to be 2050, and then it got moved forward, 2043, 2034, 2020. The latest I saw was something like 2018. I just want to emphasize that isn't actually, to me, the most important thing about um, thinking about understanding China. The most important things are, the, um, are what, what I see as the improvements of standards of living, um, raising people out of poverty, 660 million people. It doesn't really matter if China is the biggest or the second. The question is, is the growth a, on a sustainable basis, is it increasing incomes for the average Chinese? And what kinds of reforms will China need in order to make sure that what it's achieved so far is not the end of the story? Because at the moment, average incomes in China are only 8,000 US dollars. And that ranks China as actually one of the poorest countries in the bottom half, if you were to rank countries by per capita GDP, countries around the world, when they get to an upper middle income level, um, about 14,000 US dollars, their growth starts to slow considerably, and they never join the ranks of rich countries. So the OECD says in the post-war period, there only have been 17 countries that have actually overcome this level and joined the ranks of rich countries, some of which are in East Asia, uh, Singapore, South Korea, also Greece and Portugal. <laughs> but I use that as an example to suggest you can achieve it in all sorts of ways, but it's the quality of that growth that matters when you get to this level of development. Let me just show you a few graphs to indicate what I actually mean. This is just to give you a sense of the magnitudes. Um, China is about an $8 trillion economy. Um, the United States is just about double that. Um, this is why you're getting all these predictions of China's growing at nearly 8% and the US is growing at 2 to 3%. Why China looks like it's going to overtake the US. It's already remarkably close to this trap level. So this is US dollars at PPP adjusting for purchasing power parity. And what you see is that over the next few years, certainly by 2020, China will reach an average income level of about 14,000 US dollars. And that's why most of the issues that I will flag are very long-term issues. It's not about the next few years. Reforms take time. They have lags. 
Um, and it's a very experimental process. Some things work, some things don't. Um, and that's been the case for China for 30 years. 9.6% average GDP growth um, for 30 years. So if you look at the breakdown, it breaks down into about 60 to 70% of that growth can be accounted for through adding capital and adding labor. And TFP, which is a measure of productivity, the broadest measure, total factor productivity, well, that accounts for 30 to 40 percent, and that's actually that's actually pretty high. But there's more, obviously, when you look behind the numbers to really uh, go into why it is there are all these concerns about China sustaining its its growth rate. It, that TFP figure, not quite the whole story. As a whole, half of Chinese growth comes from adding capital. So one quick way for China to grow would be to add capital. But as I say, we are now talking increasingly about the quality of growth and not the quantity. Labor, um, adding workers. This actually hasn't been a big growth driver in China. And the reason is very simple. One is that it has a slowing population uh, growth rate and women have very high rates of labor force participation in China from under the centrally planned period from 49 to 79. Now the interesting stuff on TFP. TFP, productivity, this is really um, what economies wish to increase so that they can sustain their growth rate. If you break this down, the picture does get slightly more worrying. 11 to 15 percent from human capital is hardly more. In fact, it's probably slightly less than what you've gotten from just adding workers. In terms of other components of TFP, about 8 to 15 percent is from reallocation, leaving about 16 to 70 percent of growth as driven by innovation. Reallocation of factors from state-owned to private, from rural to urban, these are one-off structural changes that boost productivity but can't be sustained. So one of the reasons why TFP is hard to measure is that most of these structural changes happened by the end of the 1990s. And TFP in China noticeably slowed in that time. So here's the really interesting stuff about innovation. Looking at micro level data, it looks like about two thirds of that um, technology comes from imitation, which isn't surprising, by the way, because that's what developing countries do. They catch up and grow quickly because they move towards the technology frontier. Um, but it also suggests that true innovation, technological improvements, um, only account for about as low as 6%, as high as only 13% of Chinese growth. And for China to sustain its growth rate and to join the ranks of rich countries, it's going to have to increase that. And the rebalancing challenges I'm going to talk about next um, really emphasize that. So this is just the summary chart of the breakdown. And what it really tells you is that TFP, especially when you bring it down to the level of innovation and human capital, are the two areas that China has to focus on if it wishes to overcome the middle income country trap. The rebalancing challenges, um, there are a number of them. Um, I'm going to focus on some of the key ones, which is to increase reliance on own markets, less on exports. That's very practical if you think about it. The American consumer is never going to buy as much as um, they did before. And China is the world's biggest um, exporter already. It has 10% of global market share. It's not going to increase that by very much. But let me be very specific. They're not going to move away from exports. They just want to relatively increase domestic demand so that it's more important than trade. And that's essentially what large open economies like the US are. The US has nearly the same market share as China on global markets, but exports are a fraction um, of its GDP. Second rebalancing, raise consumption, reduce inefficient savings. Um, and I, that's an important distinction I'll show you um, in a moment. Grow the private sector because state-owned enterprises are not as productive and they distort the allocation of bank credit lending. And if China does want to grow and move up the value chain and become richer, this does become a big issue. Increase innovation, we've talked about that already, and continued opening, including firms going global. Lots of issues around opening. Um, but the reason why the going global policy is such an important policy is because if you want to move up the value chain, become globally competitive, join the ranks of rich countries, you need to produce the things which are the most competitive in the world. <coughs> so do you start from scratch and, um, and start from the very bottom and invent all, the, all of it yourself? Or do you go and you acquire it? So I remember when uh, a Chinese firm, Nanjing Automotive, purchased Rover 
And there was some surprise in Whitehall that they would even want Rover. <laughs> and I said, well, it's new technology to them. <laughs> um, and it allows them to move up into that area. So that's the going global strategy. There are real, um, it's a real push to create multinational companies um, that are Chinese. And that's why you're seeing all the investment which have left China. If you want to rely more on your own market, you have to increase the service sector, which is partly non-tradable. So in other words, manufacturing goods are for export, and it's already a very big sector in China. But services are important. Services create jobs. Services are high-skilled and low-skilled. Services could really benefit service exporting countries like Britain. And it helps China rebalance. And that's a theme that I hope we can explore some more. Race consumption as a share of GDP. So this is a graph many of you will have seen where consumption's fallen uh, to less than 40% of GDP. For most market economies, it's between half to two thirds of GDP. But the emphasis that I'll make here is that it's about raising consumption as a share of GDP. Consumption has been growing in absolute terms. Household incomes have been increasing by near double digits in many, many cities. It's about more share of income going to workers rather than to firms. Uh, State-owned enterprises, which is the blue, they haven't actually increased, they haven't decreased as much as you would think given they're less productive, less efficient. They still account for just under 30% of industrial output. Um, they still account for um, about a quarter of urban jobs. And so if they're less efficient, less productive, then they still control a fairly large share of the economy. And the question is, what is the future of these firms? China going global, this to me is the most interesting phenomenon with relevance to all of us anywhere, especially um, in Europe, um, where we could use some of this investment. But the issues around it, of course, being state directed, state finance in many instances, means that Chinese firms are now entering our markets here. And there's a lot of opportunities, but challenges around that as well. As you can see, the real pickup came after 2003. And that was the very first commercial deal ever done by China in terms of overseas M&A. And it was TCL, which bought Francis Thompson brand. Um, so before that, it was all state-owned enterprises in uh, resources. This is my hope for where these discussions and reforms will really lead China for to become um, a stable uh, country and a country that um, is, has generated um, prosperity for its people. Because for me, as I said from the beginning, that's the only reason why you, would, you should care necess, you know, about GDP in particular. Um, so by 2020, I think China needs to have restructured its economy. I think there's a lot of um, issues over quality of growth that we've discussed, and the restructuring will be important because China will probably reach that growth, at that gro even at a slower growth rate, it will hit the middle income country trap by then. So the question is, if it hasn't restructured its economy, the quality of growth is poor, then it really does raise questions about the coming decades. By 2030, I hope they will have achieved productivity and innovation as growth drivers. Um, because that would really be a hallmark of creating, a uh, moving into um, the rich country realm where they could produce goods which compete with the best products in the world. And that's a trait which is shared by a number of those countries that have um, joined the ranks of rich countries. South Korea, um, thinking about the companies um, that produce the goods there. I mean, Samsung, for instance, is those kinds of um, innovation, which are extremely important. It was very challenging working um, in China, as it is in many emerging economies. And to me, um, all of these things in the market can take place. But I always have in the back of my mind, looking at crises around the world, including in this country and in the United States, that institutions are important. And the lagging reforms in China, in terms of political reform and legal reform, um, they're going to have to speed that process up um, so that they can sustain um, a market, um, a prosperous market, and a prosperous middle class. Um, so I wanted to pick up on some of the things you said. We were kind of beginning to move into the political economy a bit in your last remarks. There was a huge discussion before the party congress last year in Yanghui earlier this year on vest the question of vested interests in China and resistance to reform. And if you look at the granular detail of things like the 12th five-year plan, mm -hmm. 
you find there's a lot of declaration, but, yes. but the closer you get to the ground, the less action there is. I just want your best mm. estimate, given how important this is to China's future economic performance, mm. what's your take on, on whether Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang will actually pull this off? They're not Zhu Rongji, they're not Deng Xiaoping. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I think every five-year plan is more like a statement of a series of aspirations. But if you talk to, um, for instance, provincial officials, um, they never get any actual uh, implementation plan. So they're always trying to uh, you know, go it alone. And I think in that sense, um, it's one of the reasons why China has grown well, in that the center never dictated how everything should um, be reformed. And I think that's true. They've allowed what's worked at the local area to expand. But I think increasingly, unless they have a much more rational system in terms of almost a federal-like system of splitting uh, revenues and um, and uh, uh, spending obligations right. or what have you. That always helps with implementing the will of the center, and I think that will actually matter. Which um, takes us to fiscal reform. The two things yes. you mentioned, urbanization and rights for migrant workers, mm hugely important, not just on humanitarian grounds, but to create this middle class, which yes. is supposed to pick up the consumer slack. Yes. That's hugely expensive. Mm. And the assumption seems to be at present that the local governments will, will pay. Mm. The local government funding model depends on land sales. Mm. And there is a huge anxiety mm. about the level of local government debt. Mm. And actually, nobody really knows, you know, and whether this is a, a you know a bubble waiting to burst, mm. whether there's a subprime crisis here, mm. but at any rate, it's not a good model for a sustainable mm. economy. So, you know, these are again the challenges of the political economy. Mm. Uh, how would you advise the Chinese government to change its financing model for local government in order to meet those challenges? Well, a couple of things they're already beginning to do, which is one of the reasons why local governments um, borrow um, from local state-owned banks and then off balance sheet borrowing yeah. SPVs. Those of uh -oh. you who live through the subprime <laughs> crisis, you're already starting to get warning bells. <laughs> is that local governments? we're not independently able to issue debt. Mm. So the municipal bond market is very underdeveloped. And given that China um, is a country which is you know, four times the population of the United States and has um, you know, nearly as many provinces as the US has states, it makes sense to develop the municipal bond market. So a few uh, provinces are now able to issue debt more independently from the center. But there's lots of other issues around this, which is, that's one source which could help, but the stability of bond markets requires institutions in and of themselves. Um, but the other part of the issue is fiscal reform in China has come in spurts. So there are periods of centralization, decentralization, big change in 1994. What they need to do now is to m have a fiscal system which is properly decentralized so that um, certain categories of revenues are local responsibility. In the US, you can think of it as state and local taxes, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and others which are federal. Mm -hmm. And this process has been extremely slow because of vested interests. But that's obviously what they need to do. They just need to have a, a rational federal system. So back to because, the vested interest question. Yeah, because so for instance, um, it's been a, the case for a number of years that migrant children should be um, allowed to be educated in urban areas. But lots of local governments don't implement that because they don't get funding. Um, and and the, the, to me, one of the, the keys to think about is that the US federal government doesn't fund everything at the state level, but they get their will imposed. Why? Because they have things they can, they can offer, almost like, you know, sort of, if you do this, you can have uh, this. So if you listen to us on speed limits, on highways, we'll give you highway funding. You know, there's almost that sense that China needs to have a system which is much more like the U.S. in terms of the federal spending system. And that would help a lot in terms of implementing what the center wants at the local level.